Thank you for having me here for your invitation here to Hebrew University and the Leonard Davis Institute. I'm really happy to be here today and I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Uppsala Conflict Data Program and the data that we offer. So a very easy overview. Um, so we, our aim is to offer comparable global data over space and time so that people can um, use it for understanding trends in armed conflict, but also use it for running statistical analysis to be able to understand the causes or the triggers of armed conflict. The UCDP has been around for about 40 years now. Um, and I think it's safe to say, even as a director, that it's one of the leading global providers of armed conflict data, particularly if you're doing work um, cross-nationally. This is the front page of our webpage. Uh, the UCDP in the database contains a, a lot of different types of information about armed conflict. It includes types about information about peace agreements, about negotiations, external support to warring parties, all sorts of things. Um, but what it's most famous for and what's sort of the foundation of the program is its data on fatalities in armed conflict, which you see in these circles here. Um, and it, that's an important proviso is that this focus on fatalities because there's a lot of different behavior that is associated with armed conflict, right? There's, um, you know, being in Israel obviously highlights a lot of these dynamics. It involves displacement of people, it involves restrictions on movement, it involves legislation, restrictions on rights, um, arrests, torture, sexual violence, all sorts of behaviors are involved in armed conflict to greater or lesser degrees. And what we focus on is one behavior, which is um, the production of, of fatalities. And fatalities have, for better or worse, become the proxy that most conflict researchers use to measure the occurrence and severity of armed conflict. And I would say the same is largely true for the policy world and journalists as well. But it's important to sort of keep that in mind, particularly as we go through the day, and I think people will be talking about other types of or dimensions of conflict that are not related to fatalities. Um, the UCDP uh, codes several different categories of violence. Uh, traditionally, this is where we started with recording interstate violence, so basically wars between or conflicts between two countries, two or more countries, and interstate violence, which is domestic conflict, basically, between a state and an armed opposition group, so rebels, insurgents. Um, there are a number of definitional criteria that I'm not going to go through, but we, we specify that there has to be some sort of fundamental issue at stake that the parties have an incompatibility over. Sometimes it's government, sometimes it's territory. The actors have to be organized. Not such a problem for interstate, but for interstate conflict, we require that they have a name, that they have some sort of organization and leadership structure, um, that they use arms, and then we require fatality thresholds for inclusion in conflict. Um, those fatality thresholds are arbitrary, but we think they capture certain dynamics. Um, for uh, a conflict to be included, uh, it has to meet a, a threshold of 25 fatalities in a year in that conflict as a way of sort of measuring that this is sufficiently serious and sufficiently organized to sort of enter the data set. And then we make a distinction between armed conflict and war, and war we define as having over a thousand fatalities in that year. Um, those data in terms of lists of armed conflicts and lists of wars are available from 1946 onwards. But we have from 1989 onwards added two additional categories of conflict. Uh, the first is called what we call non-state conflict. So this is a conflict between two groups where the state is not a party. And this can be a number of different things. So in some places, rebel groups will fight with each other. So it can be a rebel, rebel on rebel conflict. It can be rebel groups against an armed militia or a civilian defense force um, that's sort of a lot allied with the government, but not part of the government. But it can also be less organized forms of non-state conflict. So types of communal violence between uh, more unorganized groups of people, um, Hindus and Muslims in India, for example, or herders and farmers in the Sahel um, are some of the examples. And then we've also added a category called one-sided violence, which is the deliberate targeting of civilians by a state or by an organized actor. So this is a pretty broad category that would include acts like genocide and mass killing, 
um, or the 9-11 tax on the Twin Towers, for example. It's a deliberate act of, of killing of civilians. But it also includes a lot of um, low-scale violence that occurs in conflicts that I think is otherwise not noticed. So when rebel groups target informers and maybe kill one or two people. Um, so those are the, the kinds of behaviors that fall into this one-sided violence category. And for this, we have data from 1989 onwards. How do we do this, collect our data? I could spend a whole day talking to you about it, um, but I'll spend just a minute now. Uh, the 1989 onwards data is based on events data, and that's for all four categories. We have events data from 1989 onwards. Um, to code these events, we use a number of sources. Primarily, though, we rely on the news media, both the international and local news media. Um, BBC in particular offers local media in translation that we can use to help cover some language issues. About 80% of our events are coded using news media sources. But that data is supplemented with information from NGO reports, from international organizations, particularly the UN when they do special investigations, from truth commissions, from other researchers, and basically whatever raw material we can find that is sufficiently detailed for us to be able to code it and apply our definitional criteria to it. And it's important to point out, we, we're constantly updating the data, but we also go back as new sources become available. So particularly when conflicts end, there's often truth and reconciliation commissions, new methods can be brought to bear on studying the violence that took place in an area of forensic science and, and whatnot. And when those reports become available, we use that data to go back and improve our previous coding. Um, right, uh, in doing this, we have to identify unique events. And we use information like the location, the date, the characteristics of the victims and the parties involved, and other sort of attributes about these events to ensure that they are unique from each other so that we don't double count any events. Since media reports, of course, um, there will be many re media reporting the same event. And they don't always report it in the same way. So sometimes this can be a bit of a puzzle piece to figure out, are these the same things or are they different? Um, now, the fact of our focus on fatality events is important because we're going to be hearing today about other types of methodologies for measuring conflict. And we work in a very particular context. Um, there is a strong demand from researchers and from the international community that we release global data and that we do so with regularity. So we typically release data annually and we're now moving to releasing data on a monthly basis. Um, and those parameters set restrictions on the sources that are available to us to code data at that level um, and so at that level of resolution and the methods that we can bring to bear on data collection. So some of the other methodologies we're going to hear about today can be very useful for studying a particular conflict or a particular area or a particular time period but would not be viable to do globally every year or every month. So that's just something to keep in mind. It, it's sort of a specialty of our data that it is a restriction that we have. Um, this is a picture of what the database looks like for one of our coders. On the inside, what they do is they take this corpus of sources that I just talked about, they apply our definitions to each article they read or each report they read, and they determine which conflict events have taken place in each year. And you can imagine each event then as a row, basically, in this data set. They read about 50,000 news reports to do this by hand. This is all human coding, plus the additional sources. Um, it results in about 10 to 12,000 events per year on average. And that takes us about 3,500 man hours to do. Expensive Swedish hour <laughs> just so. Um, for each event, the coders make a, a low, best, and high estimate for the number of fatalities. Sometimes this may be the same for all three. Sometimes they will differ. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the best estimate is always very conservative. So UCDP's idea is to always create a baseline. So these are data that we can be sure about, that at least this much violence took place. Um, but to be clear, there's no one working on this project <laughs> that thinks that this is an accurate representation of the amount of violence, that the actual population of violence that occurs in the world. Um, what it is is a systematic, consistent application of these criteria to create some sort of baseline minimum that we can be sure about, which is important in a, in a world where um, belligerents often make claims that need to be validated or not. So this is a way of sort of setting some sort of baseline. 
Um, when the coders determine that an event has met the criteria for inclusion, they record that information um, and the, the number of fatalities, but they also geolocate where it occurred, which allows us to do some mapping and allows researchers to do analysis in terms of what the characteristics are of these places and where, where violence is taking place. No, we were initially resistant to releasing these events data. Um, we had, that's the way we built up our data internally, but we, didn't all, we just released these lists initially. We didn't release the, the raw data that we used to build up the lists. Um, and the reason uh, we released the lists was because we were quite confident in them. Um, you know, if, if, a, if a conflict reaches over a thousand, we're pretty sure we caught all the wars in the world. We didn't miss a war accidentally. Um, and the same is true even for armed conflicts. At least 25 fatalities in a year we listed as a conflict. We're pretty sure we, we, we got all of them. There may be some where there's a slight question, but for the most part, we were very confident about our lists. Um, when you move down to events data, it's much harder to be very confident that we've got everything, right? Um, this level of precision we feared would blind users uh, to the decreased level of confidence in the accuracy of our ability to, to collect the entire population of data. So that was our concern. But we nonetheless decided to release these data um, because the demand for them grew too strong, quite simply. Um, researchers nowadays need geographically disaggregated data, in part because analyzing these things at the country level is a, is a complete mismatch from for what we think about where conflict occurs. Russia is an obvious example, right? You know, there's a conflict in Chechnya. It's a very small part of Russia, but in a cross-national analysis, if you aggregate the attributes of the entirety of Russia and then you code it as being in conflict, you're, you're not, your models are going to be misspecified. And so we had to sort of respond to this need by researchers to say we need to be able to get closer to where these conflicts occur to understand what are, what are the drivers of conflict in these places. So um, to just round off by giving you a sense of how the data are used. Um, in research, um, they're, they're used a lot. I've picked a couple examples. So um, some researchers in, uh, in both Uppsala and the US have found that UN peacekeeping deployments are actually effective in reducing the amount of fighting between warring parties um, and also in reducing the number of civilians targeted and killed by warring parties, which is important because uh, UN peacekeepers tend to be deployed to areas where violence is the worst, so it's often very hard to tease out whether they're effective or not. And using these disaggregated data on their deployments allows us to evaluate whether, whether it's working or not. Um, researchers have also found that there are interconnections between different types of violence. So they found that when warring parties are losing on the battlefield, particularly when rebels are losing on the battlefield, they're more likely to target civilians. Uh, and they're more likely to do so in areas where their enemies, so the state's ethnic constituency lives. So these are the types of examples, just to give you a sense of what you can use these data um, for, although there's, there's lots of different examples. Um, the data have also been used in the climate change debate in terms of the, examining the intersection between climate and conflict. Um, there's a lot of debate in this field. Most of it is about the climactic data, um, but most of them are studying the conflict part of it using the UCDP data. Um, the general conclusion, if, if you can call it that, is that um, climatic factors tend not to have a direct effect on conflict, but instead work indirectly or in terms of mitigate, they're mitigated by institutions or by um, food security factors. And they may also help us to understand this other type of violence, the non-state violence, better than they help us to understand organized civil conflict and war. So it may create um, more tensions between communal groups. Um, the UCDP data sort of underlie a lot of this research, including in the forthcoming IPCC sixth report. Um, and then the last example I have is from the global burden of disease. I don't know if we have any, anyone here who's familiar with that. So what that project does, it's funded by the Gates Foundation. It's about 300 people who work for it, and they estimate how many people, how people die globally every year in every country. So they use um, death certificates. So government issued death certificates to study how, how people die. So how many died of a heart attack, of cancer, and so on. And they make all those estimates themselves um, using death certificates, except for armed conflict, because there you, you don't have death certificates being issued. It's not sort of outside the normal framework of how states operate in terms of estimating mortality. So for that, they use our data 
to estimate conflict mortality. So this is, you know, a few examples of how it's used both in the policy world and by researchers, just so you get a, a sense of the data. I only had a few minutes, so I couldn't walk you through the database, but the, the internet address, what is it called, the URL to the, the database is right there. Um, the data can be downloaded for free. You don't even have to register for them. And they're both available for in as packaged data sets for researchers or as an API if you want to just pull out some of the data. But it's also very, we've spent a lot of time and money trying to make it very accessible for everyone, even school kids, basically, so that you can go in, you can click on a country, you can um, see where the conflicts or where the fatalities occurred in that country. You can read narratives about the parties involved and see how um, the trends have occurred over time in those countries. And then there's, you know, a million things we can unpack about data quality and usage, um, but I think I'll just leave it there and let you ask questions after your own interests about those things. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Um, so we have four minutes for questions, which is very good. So, anyone? I can ask a question. Yeah. Yeah. So you have um, uh, um, um, a conflict in uh, South China. Uh, for instance, um, and 100 people died, but uh, I don't know if it's, it is covered by any newspaper. Mm. Are we going to find this in your data? Um, well, it has to be reported publicly. So this is the weakness of the data, is that it has to be somehow the fatalities have to be made public and with sufficient detail for us to be able to code them as well. Um, typically a conflict with you know, 100 deaths is going to come up somewhere, somehow. Um, there's very few countries that can totally close off. North Korea would be one example. Um, but uh, for the most part, I would say, as particularly these days as information technology becomes more prevalent, it's much, much harder for governments to restrict flows of information. But even before, for example, um, I, I've worked a lot on Myanmar, which, you know, during the period of the military junta really restricted reporting, but you would get a lot nonetheless because borders are still porous and human rights um, activists and refugees are going in both directions and information tends to flow out nonetheless, but the, the quality of information varies enormously and the more autocratic and the more restricted a country is, the more likely it is to be that we have poor information. Question? Danny? Yeah. Uh, I was intrigued to hear that you're coding all this by hand. Yes. <laughs> Haven't you considered using text recognition software or parsing software? Or? Of course we have. Uh, and of course, uh, other people have tried this as well. Uh, I mean, part of this is I've been kind of emphasizing fatalities in part to preempt because I knew that this question would come. So that kind of technology works much better for identifying um, certain types of events, so in various types of interactions. But determining a fatality uh, is a bit harder as well as determining which actors are involved in that fatality. So. Um, no one's been able to successfully do that yet. Uh, we just got a grant, but of course, you know, also technology, it, it moves so fast in terms of our ability to, to use it to our ends fruitfully. Uh, we have a project now that's just starting, working on trying to effectivize our human coding, our expensive Swedish hourly wages, um, to be able to pull out uh, the articles more effectively so we don't have to go through so many and be able to tell the computer to pull out parts of the information so our humans don't have to spend time coding it. But I don't think there will, at least n not with uh, the, the capabilities we have now, there's no way to validate that data except with a human experience. Because um, the reporting of conflict fatalities is often very complicated in terms of ascertaining who is targeted by whom. So who is doing this and who is it that's dying. So a civilian can die both in crossfire and they can be targeted by an armed group. And those nuances, uh, it's very difficult to tell the computer how to recognize the nuances of that, like grammatically. So we're working on it. It would be great. But so far, you know, we're hoping to just be able to do some of the original parsing parts of it and then maybe validate human-wise. But right now, we're just humanizing the whole thing. That's an idea, though. Um, one quick question, because time is out. Um, yeah, 
Um, no. very, very, very technical question. How, um, if you have data that the geo-referencing data is not very clear, you know that it's in a certain country, a certain region, how do you then input that into the information? Yeah, we there's a code book where you can see all of the steps they take, but um, so in general, uh, they will code as precise as they have information on, which in some cases may be only at the country level. But we also have a variable that indicates the level of precision of the coding. So we have a bunch of rules for where you place the, the geo dot, right, um, in cases where it's only an second level administrative information, for example. Um, so we have rules about where we place that dot, but we also have a precision indicator to indicate that um, this information is at this level of precision so that researchers can also subset data on the basis of that. Okay, thanks very yeah. much, Christine.